this is the cellular and metabolic pathways lecture s2p1 this begins the material for lecture exam two so we have very distinct but often linked pathways that produce atp within the human body if we look at atp production we can look at it through a variety of, of means but one way is through the metabolism of sugar as we break down sugars we use them for energy and produce atp to break down sugar uh, we would do glycolysis glycolysis literally means sugar breakdown glyco carbohydrate lysis break apart and uh, glycolysis only occurs with carbohydrates although we can convert some fuel sources to carbohydrates and then use glycolysis with them it can be anaerobic meaning um, we don't have an oxygen requirement or it could be aerobic where we produce uh, significantly more ATP and glycolysis happens in the cytosol so if you look at this figure here uh, this is the mitochondrion here in gray so outside the mitochondrion would be the cytosol uh, if we have glycolysis happen we end up with two pyruvate molecules and we can activate those and actually make acetylcoenzyme A out of them to go into the citric acid cycle if we do that and we go into the mitochondria to make energy then oxygen has to be available so this is an aerobic pathway and the activation step doesn't really result in too many ATP either but the citric acid cycle which the activation gets the pyruvate ready to enter the citric acid cycle uh, that makes uh, some ATP as well but uh, the nice thing about the citric acid cycle is that we can break down carbohydrates or lipids from that or we can convert proteins into the carbohydrates or lipids that eventually can be broken down in the citric citric acid cycle in glycolysis and the citric acid cycle and a few other places we make high energy carriers called NADH or FADH2 and those high energy carriers can be converted to ATP in the electron transport chain the electron transport chain happens in the mitochondria as well so it's an aerobic process it requires oxygen and that's why this ATP here on the bottom right is bigger than the two other ATPs uh, so you know the bottom line is we can take like uh, glucose through glycolysis activation Krebs and electron transport to make energy we can take lipids and go in the citric acid cycle also known as Krebs cycle and then electron transport chain um, we have to do a step first though called beta oxidation to get the fat ready for breakdown or we can convert carbohydrates into other fuel sources not carbohydrates proteins and other fuel sources and use those so we have lots of different pathways we can can make energy so we're going to spend some time talking about the carbohydrate pathway and again that's called glycolysis the location is the cytosol what we do is we take a six carbon glucose go through a series of ten reactions and end up with two three carbon pyruvates now just in terms of terminology we're not going to worry too much about this although in a chemistry class I think you have a different perspective so you probably worry about it more but technically we make lactic acid in uh, this step or pyruvic acid or succinic acid or citric acid and what happens is those are weak acids and when they're formed the hydrogen ion pretty quickly dissociates from those in the vast majority of cases and so now we're left with the ionized form which is called lactate or pyruvate or something like that so if it ends in ic acid it's an unionized form if it ends in an eight it's an ionized form 
But for us, for the most part, they're, we're going to consider them equal, the same thing. So if you said, oh, the end product of glycolysis is 2 pyruvate, like it says here, or you say the end product of glycolysis is 2 pyruvic acids, it's essentially the, the same thing. So I'm not going to make you memorize the structures. I'm not going to make you even memorize the steps in glycolysis. But I do want you to be kind of familiar with what happens. So we take glucose. We add in an ATP. And what happens is, we don't really add in the ATP. We add in the, the high energy phosphate. So we take in phosphate off of ATP, make ADP and then stick it on the glucose molecule. So we see it right here, the phosphate up here. And then we convert that glucose to fructose, which is still six carbon sugars, just a different structure. And then we stick another ATP on it, okay? So now we have two phosphates. And then we split that molecule up into two different things. And because it's not a symmetrical molecule when it's fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, it doesn't break into equal things. But when we break it apart, we immediately convert one of the things into the other thing anyway. So essentially, we can get two of, of these. And then we get some NADH out. That's going to become important. And then we get some ATP out. And then we get some more ATP out. And then we get to pyruvate. So glycolysis. There's a couple things to know about it, okay, um, and kind of look at it this way. The substrate for glycolysis is a molecule of sugar we call glucose. Glucose has six carbons, and each carbon is represented by the little circles here, all right? To get the whole process started, or again, we're not going to worry about specifically what step happens and things like that. So we'll sort of summarize the energy. We put two ATP in to start this whole process. So we sort of have to invest two ATPs worth of energy to get this working. Okay. And then we eventually split it up into two pathways that are basically parallel and end up with two three carbon pyruvates. So notice these on the right side have three little circles. Those are three carbon pyruvates. So first of all, we took a larger molecule, broke it down into smaller molecules. Okay, That's called catabolism. And in that process, when we break bonds, we liberate energy. Now, here's a good way to think about um, uh, this, this process here, why we have the NADH. Okay? So, as we split the molecule up along the pathway to become pyruvates, uh, in one step we make an NADH. That's a high energy phosphate molecule. Um, it's not really phosphate, I guess, it's uh, an electron carrier. Uh, and then we also make two more ATPs. And we do that for each three carbon pyruvate we have. So when we look at the summary of this, right, we start with two ATP. We use those up. We get two NADHs, one here at the top and one here at the bottom. And we get four ATPs out. Again, two here at the top and two here in the bottom. So we'll look at the, um, the energy harvest uh, in, in a little while and kind of look at for the whole pathway of glycolysis but you know sometimes students want to go well, why do we why do we have NADH why don't we just make ATP and and think of it this way um, bonds are just a favorable energy relationship and so bonds are really energy if I want to make a bond I have to put energy in if I want to break a bond I get energy out and just like clothes or soft drinks, bonds come in different sizes. And you can kind of think of them as small, medium, and large. A small bond, when you break it, 
would give you enough energy to make an ATP molecule, so one ATP. And a medium-sized bond, if you broke it, would give you enough energy to make two ATPs. And a large bond, if you broke it, would give you enough energy to make three ATPs. The problem is we don't have time to grab the energy when we break a bond twice or three times. It's such a fast reaction. If we don't gather the energy right now, it's gone before we can grab it a second time. And so if we broke a medium or large bond and only captured it as ATP, we'd only get one ATP out of it. We'd have a waste of energy. And by the time we tried to capture the second ATP molecule, the reaction would be over and the energy would be dissipated. So what we do is we capture that energy in intermediates. And large bonds are captured by uh, NADH, basically. So the energy is captured as NADH. And this is worth three ATPs. We'll talk about how it's worth eight, three ATPs and where that three ATPs worth of energy is, is kind of converted. But that's worth three ATPs. So you kind of think of we break a big bond, we're making NADH. Uh, if we break a little bond, we get ATP directly. So we can see that we, this is summarizing two distinct reactions, right? So here we make an ATP. And then here in the bottom, we make an ATP in red. So those are just two separate reactions, but they've summarized them together for just ease of, of counting. Um, and then not shown here, there's another intermediate. Uh, it's called FADH2. Uh, so FADH2 uh, also is an energy carrier. And not surprisingly, if NADH gives me three ATP and ATP gives me one ATP, then FADH2 would be right in the middle and give me two ATP. And so again, it's just a way to carry energy so that you can convert it to ATP later. So there are two ways to make energy, to make ATP. One way is called substrate level phosphorylation. And in substrate level phosphorylation, we directly make ATP. And basically what you do is you have an enzyme. Right, some sort of enzyme. Here's my substrate. That's what enters the reaction. And what we do is we take a phosphate, transfer it to ADP to make ATP. Okay. This is direct transfer of energy. And so sometimes substrate level phosphorylation is called direct ATP. Now there's a, another type of phosphorylation that we'll talk about that is indirect, and that's called oxidative phosphorylation. And that happens in the mitochondria. Uh, kind of a, a similar idea, but it's a, you know, we're making ATP, we're just making it a slightly different way. Uh, this shows another example of substrate level phosphorylation where we turn ADP directly into ATP. So anytime you see ATP come directly out of a pathway, that's substrate level phosphorylation, okay? Now again, if you look here, this is NADH, right? So this gives us NADH. Don't worry about the H plus. That's just kind of um, keeping track. Of, what is it? The stoichiometry. That's keeping track of everything. But we're just going to worry about the NADH molecule because that's where the energy is. So uh, the NADH also carries energy. But if we make NADH, and this, this process is actually using NADH up. But if we make NADH up, uh, if we make NADH uh, we're not doing substrate level phosphorylation because we didn't directly make ATP. Now, in the right situation, this NADH can be converted actually into three ATP. So this is indirect ATP, and it can only be converted in the mitochondria in the presence of oxygen. So that's called oxidative phosphorylation. But, um, you know, that's called indirect, and we're going to count that as, as indirect. Um, when we look at glycolysis and, and pyruvate, uh, we'll come back to this idea a little bit and talk about what, what happens to pyruvate when you make it. So this is just the last step in glycolysis. Um, so we have what, you know, this is step number, enzyme number 10. So we have nine other enzymes before this um, that have got, helped get us to where we are. Uh, 
and then once we make pyruvate in humans, you can either convert the pyruvate into lactate, or you can go into the mitochondria and, and make um, energy out of it that way. Actually, technically, there's a third choice. You can go backwards and make glucose again as well. So there are different choices that we have. There aren't really choices, but uh, we'll, uh, what to do with that, that energy right there. You know, there's different directions we can go. So when we have pyruvate, there are two pathways we can take. In cases where we don't have oxygen, we can do the process of what's called fermentation. Fermentation, and I think, you know, all of you understand this, uh, you know, we live fairly close to Napa Valley in the wine country, right? And fermentation talks about, um, you know, turning sugar into alcohol. And the way you do that is through yeast uh, and glycolysis. So what alcohol does basically, or I guess not alcohol, what yeast does basically is to take sugar and through glycolysis in the anaerobic situation, convert it to ethanol, and that's what, how we make wine, as an example. So that's fermentation. Well, we also do fermentation, but we have a different enzyme. And so instead of making alcohol, like yeast would, we make lactate. And in fact, other organisms can make other products through the fermentation pathway. And we're not going to worry about those. We're just going to worry about us. And so that's uh, lactate. So when we have no oxygen present or uh, we have other situations where pyruvate is running into the enzyme that turns into lactate, we're going to follow this pathway and take some of the pyruvate at least and make some lactate. Okay, That's called anaerobic. Okay. And there's usually low oxygen available, although it can be done in a high oxygen environment. It's just not as appreciable. So you don't have to have the anaerobic comp component for anaerobic glycolysis. Uh, notice this happens in the cytosol. Here's my mitochondrion, right? So we're outside the mitochondria in the cytosol. And we make relatively few ATP. We'll count these up a little later. Uh, but we don't get very much ATP from it. Uh, that's not such a bad thing in, in the long run. And we'll talk about what we can do with the uh, end product um, and what happens uh, metabolically with some of them. The other choice when you have pyruvate at the end of glycolysis is you can have the pyruvate enter the mitochondria. You can activate it where it becomes this acetyl coenzyme A unit. And that enters the citric acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, also known as the tricarboxylic acid cycle. And then as it goes through the cyclic phase, it produces a lot of ATP, uh, one directly and 11 indirectly. So, also sitting fairly close to this is the electron transport or electron transport chain. And that converts the indirect ATP we made in the citric acid cycle and other places into uh, uh, ATP that we can use in order to fuel the body processes. So pyruvate in summary has two fates. Uh, in cases where there's low or no oxygen or in cases where there's high oxygen and just this some of this happens randomly we convert pyruvate to ethanol in the cytosol when oxygen is present we can go through the aerobic uh, respiration and pyruvate enters the mitochondria remember mitochondria have the requirement to function within with oxygen and gets converted to acetyl coenzyme A and eventually the citric acid cycle uh, to make uh, energy. Now, 
The reason why we undergo anaerobic glycolysis is to regenerate the NAD plus so the reactions can keep going. Um, what I mean by that, let's go back, way back. Not that far, this one. So if you look right here in this green box here, we take NAD plus and uh, make NADH. Okay. So we make this big, huge energy carrying constituent that is eventually worth 3 ATP. But the only way we can make ATP out of it is it has to enter the mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, we can convert it to ATP, but mitochondria need oxygen. Okay. Well, sometimes we don't have oxygen available to do that. And sometimes we need oxygen right now and we don't want to wait for it. And so what we do is we take pyruvate and convert it into lactate, that anaerobic pathway we just talked about. But in order to do that, we have to take the NADH that we made here and break it back down. So we started with an NAD plus, see the arrow? At NAD plus, and we'll make NADH plus H plus. Again, we're not going to worry about the H plus. So we put the NADH in, and we get NAD plus out. All right. So now this can go up here, and this can keep the, the anaerobic glycolysis working. And we can make a lot of energy very quickly this way. Uh, the problem is you can't do it for very long uh, for a number of reasons, but one of those is you're making lactic acid. That lactic acid can build up, change pH, and affect proteins and things like that. So it gives us a, a, not a huge yield of ATP, but a very rapid ATP yield. But it comes at, a, at an expense. Um, most people can do anaerobic glycolysis for less than 30 seconds, meaning that if you are under true anaerobic means, you can generate energy for the maximum of about 30 seconds before you have to, to quit exercise. Um, that would be a high intense exercise. For those of you you know familiar with interval training, that would be uh, what you're doing there. So there's no oxygen requirement, but that can still occur in the presence of oxygen. And what we do is we actually have a lot of energy stored in lactate. And what we can do is we can, when we're done exercising, uh, we can take lactate and through a process called gluconeogenesis. Uh, and sometimes it's called the Cori cycle. We can basically go backwards from pyru uh, backwards to pyruvate, and then from pyruvate go backwards glycolysis basically, and make glucose. Okay, it's actually a good name if you think about it. Gluco glucose neo new genesis make. So making new glucose from non carbohydrate precursors is referred to as gluco neo genesis. And that energy is still used in the body. It's not lost, right? But it's just stored as lactate, and we can reverse things and, and keep some of that energy uh, in our body. So let's kind of look at an energy summary and kind of look at these, uh, what they call metabolic economics. So for anaerobic glycolysis, we're going to look at this a little differently a little later. Uh, for one glucose molecule, we start with the glucose. We have to put two ATP in at the beginning again. And we get two lactate out and four ATP out. Okay. So the columns are going to fill in for anaerobic glycolysis. ATP used. ATP used is the number of ATP broken down. It's the number that we have to input into the reaction. That's two. ATP direct, remember direct is when we make ATP via substrate level phosphorylation. It means literally we just write ATP. So the ATP direct, that's four. All right, let's go way back. So here's my two ATP used. Here's one. Here's two. Notice the arrows are into the reaction. So we use that one. We use this one. Okay. 
ATP out, we have this one. And this is on the opposite side of the arrow, and this one. But remember, when we split it up, this is times 2, this is times 2. So there's my 4 ATP out. NADH net, that's the number of NADH net produced. Okay. Now, we don't have any because we had to use it to make lactate. Remember, this is anaerobic glycolysis. So by definition, the substrate, what we start with is glucose. The end product is lactate. So we're saying we're making lactate for sure. So if we look here, when we make lactate, we take that NADH we made here and used it up, right? And so it's net. We made one, we used one, our net is zero. Okay, so that's why it's zero here. We didn't mention anything about FADH2 in this uh, little table, so we'll worry about that later. ATP indirect is how much ATP you get through oxidative phosphorylation. So basically that happens in the electron transport chain. And so really, it's how much energy do you get from NADH and FADH2. We said the energy equivalence for NADH, we're going to consider three. And for the FADH2 energy equivalence, we're going to consider two. So you're going to multiply your NADH net by three to get your ATP indirect and add that to your FADH2 net, right? Um, and the FADH2 net is two multiplied by how many FADH2s you have. You'd add those two together, and that would be your ATP indirect. For anaerobic glycolysis, we don't make any NADH. We don't make any FADH2, so those are all zeros, including ATP indirect. Now, some people use a different energy equivalent for NADH and FADH2. And the difference is sort of the best way to explain it is, uh, you know, many of you have jobs or had jobs. Uh, maybe you've taken off work so you can devote your time to studying. And let's say you got a job that made 20 hours, that's worth 20 hours, um, and you made $20 an hour, right? So you should make $400, right? 20 hours, $20 an hour, you should make $400. But you go into the office to pick up your paycheck, you don't really get $400, you get less than $400 because of taxes and, and other things. So your gross pay, right, would be 400, but your net pay would be significantly less than that. It might only be, you know, $280 uh, because of all the other money they've taken out of it. And that's sort of the way the NADH and FADH2 work. Uh, some books use the uh, gross energy and some books use the net energy. And basically, it takes a little energy to turn NADH and FADH2 into energy. We're going to ignore those, and we're just going to make it easier and go with 3 and 2 for the equivalent. Some people do 2.5 and, and 1.5, and but then it becomes kind of difficult when you're trying to deal with what's a half of ATP. So we'll go with what is considered the gross uh, values, and that's 3, NAD, uh, 3 ATP through NADH and 2 FA. At 2 ATP per FADH2. Okay. Your ATP total here is direct plus indirect. So direct is 4, indirect is 0, 4 plus 0 is 4. ATP net is total minus used. So I had 4 total. I subtract out my 2 I used. I'm left with 2. So my net is 2. The net CO2 produced, we haven't looked at it yet, but the CO2 uh, actually grabs on to basically oxygen. So we have a carbon that grabs on to oxygen and becomes a CO2 molecule. If you remember when we looked at glycolysis, I like this one the best, we started with a six carbon glucose and ended up with two three carbon pyruvates. So my total carbons to start is six, my total carbons to end is six, which means no carbons came off, which means I can't make any CO2. So that's why the CO2 is zero. Um, as a good rule of thumb, think about the oxygen requiring 
portion of the mitochondria. Mitochondria need oxygen to work. Not surprisingly, the main place we're going to worry about CO2 coming off will be from the mitochondria in processes that take place in there. So we have that carbon, and now we put that oxygen on it, basically, and make CO2. So the CO2 net is zero, because we don't have any CO2 yet for anaerobic glycolysis. Now, as I mentioned before, we can make glucose from other precursors, and that's called gluconeogenesis. Again, you can kind of see it going down this arrow right here. Why do we care about glucose? Well, glucose is an essential fuel uh, for a couple reasons, but one of the big main reasons is that the brain and the nervous system use glucose almost exclusively um, for fuel. And so if you don't have adequate glucose, then we won't have adequate brain function and nervous system function. And so our body has evolved uh, a way to say, okay, if you don't have glu enough glucose, we can make other things into glucose and use that um, in order to make energy. Now, one of the problems that humans have, at least from a, a modern day picture, is if you eat any excessive calorie, whether it's glucose, so if you eat too much sugar, or protein, you eat too much protein, or lipid, you eat too much fat, or even alcohol, you drink too much alcohol. All of those excessive calories are going to be turned into lipid, into fat. We store our fat as triglyceride in our body. And so excessive calories, right, go into that triglyceride pool. We do not have the ability to turn that fat, even if it came from glucose, back into sugar. So we have to have other means to turn things into sugar. And again, because of that requirement that we need uh, glucose for fuel for the nervous system, we need glucose for fuel for the brain, which is part of the nervous system. We need glucose for the ability to have anaerobic metabolism so we have some available that way. Um, then we have to look at where can we make gluconeogenesis what precursors can we do that with okay so lactate we can do gluconeogenesis the intermediates within glycolysis remember it was uh, you know 10 enzymes from glucose to pyruvate right so here's the first one glucose 6-phosphate at least going in this direction not the first enzyme here's the first intermediate right um, so uh, the enzyme is called glucokinase that does this but uh, what happens uh, is that we can go backwards in glycolysis and take any of those intermediates and make glucose out of it. We can take certain amino acids. They're called glucogenic amino acids, right? Gluco, glucose, genic, make. So we can make, not all amino acids are glucogenic. Um, and we can turn those into uh, glucose. We can turn glycerol into glucose. Um, most of it occurs in your liver, although the kidney does a little bit as well. And these are what we call endergonic reactions, right? We looked at those in, in the S1P5, uh, the enzyme energy section from the last exam. Um, and endergonic reactions... Um, uh, take energy. So we have to put ATP in because we're building bigger bonds. Okay. So a couple terminology things. If we make new glucose, it's called gluconeogenesis. It's confusing because if we make the amino acids that make glucose, through gluconeogenesis are called glucogenic amino acids. They don't have the word neo in them, 
So that becomes confusing. Uh, in addition, if we have excessive glucose in our cells, we can make glycogen out of it. Glycogen is the way we store energy from glucose. If we make glycogen, it's called glycogenesis, glyco sugar. In this case, it actually is glycogen. And I guess they thought glycogen genesis sounded stupid, so they call it glycogenesis. So it's synthesis making glycogen. If we want to break down glycogen, it's called uh, glycogenolysis, glycogen olysis, right? So break down glycogen. And so we'll break down glycogen into glucose and then use that, use that as fuel. So that's kind of what we look at for that. As I said before, our excess glucose is converted into lipids. And without getting too much into it, right, what we do is we basically take excess sugar, and this happens in our liver, and turn it into fatty acids, which then we throw on the glycerol and make triglycerides and store as fat. Okay. And so triglycerides are made in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and then stored in our adipose tissue primarily uh, as fat. So uh, we'll come back to, to some of these things, but uh, just to kind of look at a little more uh, overview of the things we're looking at. Um, we can use glucose for energy. We can use fats for energy. We can use proteins for energy. Okay. And for glucose for energy, we're going to do glycolysis. And then we're going to do the Krebs. And then we're going to do oxidative phosphorylation. I have a step in the middle of that. That's activation. We can use fat for energy. So we have to break down the triglyceride. It's called lipolysis. And we can uh, take that and break it down into energy through a process called beta oxidation. And then that goes into the Krebs cycle and then makes energy in the electron transport chain. And the amino acids... What we'd have to do with those is we have to deaminate them. We have to take off that amino group. And then the amino acids, depending on what type they are and what the need is, um, sometimes we make glucose out of it, and sometimes we make acetylcholine A units out of it. Um, and so we can turn those in, in for energy. So we have a lot of pathways where we can make energy. We have a lot of redundancy uh, in there as well um, so that uh, we can basically uh, be able to get energy a variety of ways so that we don't start with that. Okay. Um, we don't have, so don't run out of energy. So the anaerobic pathway is pretty simple. Glucose, go through glycolysis, make pyruvate convert the pyruvate to lactate. And again, we don't have very much. We started with two ATP. We get four direct out, and then we get uh, four total, and then we get two net. It's two net because we had two that we started with, and if we didn't do anything, we'd still have those two. So we made four at the end total. We have to subtract the two we started with, so we make two ATP net uh, in anaerobic glycolysis. It's fairly simple. It's a little more complicated when we do the aerobic metabolism. So we'll go down this pathway now and see what happens um, in terms of uh, getting into the mitochondria, activating the pyruvate to acetylcholine A, going through the electron transport chain uh, after the citric acid cycle, and figuring out the energy uh, yields there. So those uh, energy metabolic economics that I mentioned before, we'll look at it in more detail. So we'll look at carbohydrates first, um, and uh, we'll look at it in you know, some pretty good detail. So this is probably a good place to stop um, this uh, one, this video, and uh, start a new one because this is a nice place to stop.